Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna take a look at this thing. Now, this is pretty clearly the brand new Apple Mac Mini M1 edition, but why I say it's new, and you may be sitting there thinking like, oh, hey, uh, actually, I saw this come out last year. It did, but this is the brand new 10 gigabit ethernet version. When the original M1 Mac Mini launched, it only had a one gigabit ethernet NIC in it, which was okay, I guess, but it wasn't necessarily anything super exciting. Now at STH, we generally review very high-end gear. So for example, a lot of people say that this is the fastest networking you can get with like a small eight-core ARM chip. It's like 10 gigabit ethernet. That's awesome. It's so exciting. But to us, a fast ARM-based processor with fast networking looks like this. This is a Mellanox Bluefield 2 card, which also has 16 gigabytes of memory, an 8-core ARM chip, has an OS SSD on board, and for networking, it has two 100 gigabit Ethernet ports. But that Mellanox Bluefield 2 is a completely different class of device. I mean, that's something you might want to put in a server, but in terms of something that you want to put on your desk and use every day, the Mac Mini is way better. Now at STH, we've been running a series called Project Tiny Mini Micro. We've been looking at the one liter desktop PCs, really the corporate desktop PCs from companies like Lenovo, HP, and Dell, hence Tiny Mini Micro. And at this point, we've reviewed something like three dozen of those systems going back a couple generations all the way up to the most current generation. And there are definitely a couple pieces of feedback we get. First is, can you do a Mac Mini, which is exactly what we're doing today. And the second piece of feedback, which is really important, is that a lot of users really ask on those PCs whether or not there's an option to get higher speed networking. The vast majority of those PCs only have one gigabit ethernet as standard. However, certain higher end models do have the ability to go put higher end networking in there, whether that's two and a half gig ethernet or faster networking. So as part of today's review, I really wanna give you an idea in terms of you know what the hardware is and what the features are of the system. I also wanna go and talk a little bit about the different configuration options. You may have seen on STH that this is not our first one of these. In fact, we this is I think the fourth one that we have we actually showed how to rack mount these Mac minis, I think a couple months ago. But now that we have a couple different configurations, I definitely have some advice to go through the Apple configurator and really think through what you want. We're also gonna take a special mention and take a special look at the performance because I know there have been some questions on you know, how it works and you know what's really going on with that 10 gig ethernet controller in this system. So we're gonna take a special deep dive on that. So overall, the hardware in this is almost, I mean, if you're looking at it externally, you would have almost no idea that there's something better in this system than the base model. On the back of the system, we get two USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, which means that those are 10 gigabit per second type A ports. We get a single HDMI output. There are then two USB 4 Thunderbolt 3 combo ports on the system. And you can actually get an extra display output out of one of those Thunderbolt ports, which gives you the ability to run two different displays off of this little system. You also get a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack because but why not? There's a power input. Now, something that's very different between this unit and also the Project Tiny Mini Micro one liter PCs from HP, Dell, and Lenovo is the fact that this has an internal power supply. There's a RJ45 port, and it looks almost exactly the same as the port that we would have on the one gigabit model, but this one actually is 10 gigabit. Inside, we get 802.11ax, which is Wi-Fi 6. We don't get Wi-Fi 6e with this, which is kind of a bummer, but I get it. We also get Bluetooth 5 because, yeah, everybody wants Bluetooth in their systems these days, right? We're going to focus a little bit more on the 10 gig networking, I think, in the performance section, because that's really the difference in performance. Now, this does use the Apple M1 chip, which is an ARM-based processor designed by Apple. And frankly, Apple did an excellent job. There are plenty of performance reviews, so I don't really want to like rehash something that's been done 300 times at this point, or probably more than that. The fact is that this is an eight-core ARM processor. You have eight GPU cores, and it's fairly low power because it's on TSMC 5 nanometer. The flip side to it is that this is called an M1 or an Apple Silicon-based Mac rather than an x86 or Intel-based Mac. Apple does have their Rosetta software, which allows you to do the translation from x86 into their new ARM silicon. 
But what you can definitely see in the industry is the fact that the M1 Mac Mini has a little bit less support for hardware and just applications in general than you typically see on some of the you know, Intel x86 ones just because they have a longer history. That is rapidly changing, but a really good example is I actually use this exact camera, which is a Canon C70, and I hook it up to my M1 Mac Mini, and I have a little 4K converter to allow me to use that as a webcam. And when I try using my C70 as a webcam on an Apple Silicon Mac, Zoom just absolutely will not have it. Citrix Go to Meeting will not have it. For whatever reason, that just does not work. And right now I'm still waiting for a fix. You might be able to see that I actually have a MacBook Pro based on the M1 Silicon right here. They're basically the exact same chip. And so I get to see a lot of these little compatibility things over time. I will say though, that certainly since the newer chips have been released, since the M1 has been released, there's a lot less that doesn't work. So it might just kind of, general sense that this is one of those things that over the next couple quarters, you're just not gonna even notice anymore. But let's face it, this is an absolutely good looking piece of hardware. I mean, if nothing else, this thing is a very attractive package. It's definitely way bigger than a system like this needs, but at the same time, you have to admit it has some nice lines. And given we have Project Tiny Mini Micro where we have a ton of these systems, as you might imagine, that has caused some problems on the home front. When I first brought the M1 Mac Mini with 10 gig ethernet inside, I made the mistake of putting it right next to the Dell Optiplex 7080 Micro that we just reviewed. And you know what happens when the old model meets the new model. Just let me explain. But you can have up to 64 gigabytes of memory. This is only 16. If you got my number, don't add me. Cause baby, I'm on my elitist. Sure, it's better looking and it has 10 gig ethernet, but you're cheaper. I'm on hiatus. You have expandable M.2 storage and this is soldered. Things are definitely a little bit awkward around the house now. Okay, I know some people are gonna be like, hey, that is not STH dry, boring server content. What's going on here? You can't have any fun. But I kind of decided this weekend that I wanted to have a little fun, so I shot that bit. So let's dive into that 10 gig ethernet controller because I think that's really the big reason that you would get this over one of the earlier versions of this M1 Mac Mini. The chip itself is an AQC 1113. And what that practically means is that that's an Aquantia action with a Q action controller. Now Aquantia was purchased by Marvell, so it's now part of that Marvell umbrella. And the reason that Marvell purchased Aquantia was, well, one of the big reasons at least was because they had a very low power and low cost controller for you know two and a half gig, five gig, and 10 gig networking. It just so happens that we did test it and this particular configuration can support the two and a half and five gig ethernet as well as one gig if you want that. So a reason to purchase this that a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that even if you don't have 10 gig ethernet, maybe you only have two and a half gig ethernet, we just did a trend net two and a half gig ethernet switch review. If you have two and a half gig ethernet and you just want something that's faster than one gig, you can actually get this 10 gig one and get two and a half times the speed of the normal one gig one for $100, which is probably not worth it. But if you just like a clean solution, sure. Another big one that we've got questions on, and I think that some people are just kind of going off online and saying that there's an issue here, is the fact that this shows up when you go look at it in macOS, you can see that it says that there's only a buy one link to the controller. And the reason that that could be a problem is that with PCIe Gen 3, a buy one link was not enough to handle a full 10 gigabit per second connection. It just doesn't have enough interface bandwidth to handle it. So what that means is that if this was a PCIe Gen 3 by one connection, you would only get, well, well less than 10 gigabit per second out of this 10 gig port. So of course we had to test it out because, well, we had to see if that was actually a bottleneck. And as you would kind of expect, that was not what we saw at all. You're gonna notice that this iPerf 3 test is nine point something gigabits per second. It is pretty normal that you get a little bit below, you know, 10 gigabit speeds on a 10 gigabit NIC. So this is effectively a 10 gig ethernet connection, even though it doesn't say 10 gigabits per second here. There's always a little bit of a delta between the rated speed and what you actually test on a tool like this. 
And we're also doing a very simple test just to see if we get above like eight gigabits per second. So we know that we're not on a PCIe Gen 3 link. Now, I know a lot of people that will buy this are gonna buy this for like a lab or a home lab or something like that. And something to just keep in mind is that the fact that we get 10 G base T is good. A lot of people wanna use SFP plus for their labs because it tends to be, you know, lower cost switches. We did do a little piece on 10G base T to SFP plus converter. So if you wanna use an SFP plus switch with a system like this, you can totally go do that. But in that fun little segment, we did dig into a couple of, I guess, really important little facets as you're going through the configurator. And now that I have, I guess, four of those, plus I have, you know, this MacBook Pro M1 in front of me, I definitely have some thoughts in terms of what you should do on the configurator. First off, all of these M1 Macs have eight gigabytes of unified memory. Frankly, for me, and this is definitely gonna vary for a lot of folks, but for me, eight gigs is just frankly not enough. And in fact, the 16 gigs, which is a $200 upgrade is is frankly a little bit less or way less than I would normally want in a system these days. Now this memory is LP DDR4X memory. And the big difference here is just the fact that that is actually as part of the M1 package all soldered together. And so it's not user upgradable. I mean, you can't just go get an SODIM and plop it in here and get more memory as you could with previous generations. Also, the Project Tiny Mini Micro nodes, they have the ability to just go and you can go buy two 32 gig DIMMs. You're gonna spend about maybe $150, $160 per. Install those and you have 64 gigabytes of memory in a system. Now on the Mac Mini configurator, going from eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes is $200. And what I can definitely tell you is that as someone who purchases a lot of 32 gig DIMMs, spending $200 for an incremental eight gigabytes of memory is like, it's hard to, to stomach. I mean, that, that, that just feels like a lot more. But the other thing is that you only get a maximum of 16 gigabytes of memory. So on the Project 10 Mini Micro Nodes, a lot of those we run with 32 or 64 gigabytes, just because we tend to run out of memory before we run out of processor performance. And so I'm just gonna go throw up a little image, hopefully, of as I'm reviewing this video, how much memory I'm actually using. I have one system that's 128 gigs, one that is 256 gigs as desktops. And so you can just kind of tell that I use a lot of memory. So eight gigs is just feels way too small. 16 still feels small, but I think that's much better. And that's actually what I ended up getting in my MacBook Pro to take along with me. Now, the next option is storage. And what's interesting here is that the base model that's $699 and less sometimes with discounts, you get 256 gigs of storage, which is, I guess, enough for a lot of folks. On one of my Mac minis, I actually upgraded the storage to 512 gigs. I also got the 512 gig SSD option on my MacBook because frankly, if I'm you know, on an airplane or something like that, I don't wanna go and have a external drive plugged in unless I absolutely have to. On the Mac mini though, as this was my fourth one, I actually ended up getting just the base 256 gig SSD. And the reason I got 256 gig SSD in this one, and I didn't pay that extra $200 for that 512 gig SSD is just the usage model and specifically with the 10 gig ethernet. We recently did a review of a QNAP NAS, which has 10 gig ethernet, also has Thunderbolt, and you can use both the Thunderbolt as well as the 10 gig ethernet to connect this Mac mini to that system. To me at least, the reason to get the 10 gig ethernet is really so that way you can go access a NAS and you can get to faster, lower cost storage. So for this one, we have a relatively low amount of local storage. And just to kind of give you some, you know, frame of reference like we did with the memory. When you look at SSD pricing, we do reviews of M.2 SSDs and generally one terabyte M.2 SSD as we're doing this video is somewhere in maybe the, you can get a decent PCIe Gen 3 one for, you know, one terabyte one for maybe about $120 and by $200 you can get a PCIe Gen 4 one. And so really in that $120 to $200 range, you could buy an incremental one terabyte of flash. But Apple has soldered that on and charges a total of $400 for the upgrade from 256 to one terabyte. So my key tip here is to not get that with the M1 Mac mini. I mean, unless you absolutely need a very, very large root directory, but if you're gonna have you know, files or anything like that, media that you don't necessarily need to have on that base OS disk, then I think you're way better off getting a high-speed USB device because frankly, the USB devices these days can actually have more throughput than the old SATA SSDs. So I think for local storage, if you just need fast cache that's close by and just you know storage for media or whatever, I really think that getting the 
external SSD is the way to go on a system like this. It's not quite as fast as the internal one, but just kind of price performance wise, I think that that's a no brainer. Also with the 10 gig ethernet, if you need to get to a lot more storage, like let's say, you know, you need a several hundred terabytes of storage. I think that the 10 G base T is a better option. That as well, you do hit some more latency because you're going over the network versus inside the system, but you do also get more sequential read and write performance because you have a 10 gigabit connection, whereas you only have a six gigabit connection with the old SATA six gigabit per second drives. Or another way to think about it is that the 10 gigabit ethernet is actually faster than the six gigabit SATA three connection that's on a lot of hard drives. So. To me, the reason I would spend the $100 on the 10 gig ethernet is because that also allows me to avoid the extra cost of putting a larger SSD in the system. I think between the network bandwidth plus the ability to use USB drives, there's basically no reason to go and upgrade unless you just absolutely need internal storage. So let's talk about competition real quick because I think that's really important for understanding why you purchase these or maybe why you would not purchase them. Actually, what I've been using as a stand for this, which is this little nook that I have right here. Now you can see that this is much smaller than Intel nook. It's 11th gen, so this actually uses a newer processor, which is called Tiger Lake. And you can see that it is way smaller than this Apple M1 Mac mini. Now this uses an external power brick, which is absolutely huge. And we do have a video on that as well. Now this Nook has more USB ports. It has the Thunderbolt as well as the USB 4 ports, just like the M1 Mac mini. It comes with two HDMI ports as well. So you, you don't have just a single port, HDMI port on the back, which is nice because it can power more displays. And it actually does come with the two and a half gig ethernet solution from Intel, which is the Intel i225, which is a little bit more than a Realtek unit, but it's not like $10 more, it's like single digit dollars more. And speaking of that two and a half gig ethernet, I really wish that the base model of the Mac mini had two and a half gig ethernet. So I guess this is, you know, not something that a lot of people know, but when you look at a Realtek, for example, two and a half gig ethernet controller, the incremental cost for getting a two and a half gig ethernet over a one gigabit ethernet controller is like not even a dollar a lot of times. And so I think that that's something that, you know, it just to me, I think most people that buy these systems, if you could tell them like, hey, it would cost Apple about a dollar more to go and put a two and a half times faster ethernet connection on there. I think most Mac users would probably want that, right? I mean, this is the same company that's charging $200 for 256 gigabytes of NAN. Just for completeness sake, we did just double check and make sure that the M1 chip was performing about the same as we saw with the one gig version. And basically it was, it was within a margin of error. Also on the power consumption side, a lot of the old 10 G base T NICs were very, very high power. But as I mentioned earlier, the Quantia NIC is actually a relatively low power device. And we didn't really see a huge impact. There was a little bit more power consumption, but it wasn't necessarily like a huge power impact compared to the one gig version. All right, so summing this up, I think that if you're a developer and you need to do M1 silicon development, I think you basically need to get a Mac mini, whether that's the base model or this one. I think this is definitely more usable with 16 gigabytes of memory and 10 G base T networking. Now I know that there are some interesting ways that you can get Linux and stuff like that on systems like this, but just in general, I think that if you don't want to be running Mac OS as your primary OS, I just think that this is kind of a harder sell. If you want to be running Linux or Windows or something like that, I do think that the just kind of vanilla, you know, x86 is probably a better option at this point. That may change in the future, but that's just kind of where we are as of today. Overall, as my fifth M1 system, I think that this is absolutely awesome. The 10 G base T allows you to use things like network attached storage to really expand the amount of data that you can access with the Mac mini. And I think that that is absolutely the way that I would recommend to all of our readers, just because I know a lot of you are running higher speed networking. Hey, I hope you like this look at the Apple Mac mini M1 10 G base T edition. And if you did, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe, turn on notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.